Old John of Gaunt, time-honored Lancaster, hast thou, according to thy oath and band, brought hither Henry Bolingbroke, thy bold son, here to make good the boisterous late appeal, which in our leisure would not let us hear, against the Duke of Norfolk, Thomas Mowbray? I have, my leash. Tell me, moreover, hast thou sounded him, if he appeal the Duke on ancient malice, or, worthily, as a good subject should, on some known ground of treachery, as near as I could sift him on that argument, on some apparent danger seen in him aimed at your highness, no inveterate malice. Ourselves will hear the accuser and the accused freely speak. High stomached are they both, and full of ire, in rage, deaf as a sea, hasty as fire. And the years of happy days befall my gracious sovereign, my most loving liege. Each day still better others' happiness, until the heavens, envying the earth's good hap, add an immortal title to your crown. We thank you both, yet one but flatters us, as well appeareth by the cause you come, namely, to appeal each other of high treason. Cousin of Hereford, what dost thou object against the Duke of Norfolk, Thomas Mowbray? In the devotion of a subject's love, tendering the precious safety of my prince, Come I appellant to this princely presence. Now, Thomas Mowbray, do I turn to thee. Thou art a traitor and a miscreant, too good to be so and too bad to live. Since the more fair and crystal is the sky, the uglier seem the clouds that in it fly. Once more, the more to aggravate the note, with a foul traitor's name stuff I thy throat, and wish, so please my sovereign, ere I move, what my tongue speaks, my right-drawn sword may prove. Let not my cold words here accuse my zeal. The blood is hot that must be cooled for this, setting aside his high blood's royalty, and let him be no kinsman to my liege. I do defy him, and I spit at him. Call him a slanderous coward and a villain, which to maintain I would allow him odds and meet him were I tied to run afoot, even to the frozen ridges of the Alps, or any other ground inhabitable, wherever Englishman durst set his foot. Meantime, let this defend my loyalty. By all my hopes, most falsely doth he lie. Pale, trembling coward, there I throw my gauge disclaiming here the kindred of the king, and lay aside my high blood's royalty, which fear, not reverence, makes thee to accept. If guilty dread have left thee so much strength as to take up mine honor's pawn, then stoop. I take it up, and by that sword I swear, which gently laid my knighthood on my shoulder, I'll answer thee in any fair degree, or chivalrous design of knightly trial, and when I mount alive may not I May I not light, if I be traitor, or unjustly fight. What doth our cousin lay to Mowbray's charge? It must be great that can inherit us so much as of a thought of ill in him. Look, what I speak, my life shall prove it true. That all the treasons for these eighteen years, complotted and contrived in this land, fetch from false Mowbray their first head and spring. Further I say, and further will maintain, upon his bad life to make all this good, that he did plot the Duke of Gloucester's death, suggest his soon-believing adversaries, and consequently, like a traitor coward, slewest out his innocent soul through streams of blood. Thomas of Norfolk, what sayst thou to this? Let my sovereign turn away his face and bid his ears a little while be deaf till I have told this slander of his blood how God and good men hate a foul liar. Cobray. Impartial are our eyes and ears. Now by my scepter's awe, I make a vow. Such neighbor nearness to our sacred blood should nothing privilege him. He is our subject, Mowbray, so art thou. Free speech and fearless I to thee allow. Then, Bolingbroke, as low as to thy heart through the false passage of thy throat, thou liest. Uh, for Gloucester's death, I, I slew him not, but to my own disgrace neglected my sworn duty in that case. Uh, for you, my noble lord of Lancaster, the honorable father of my foe, once did I, I lay an ambush for your life, a trespass that doth vex my grieved soul. But ere I last received the sacrament, I did confess it, and exactly begged your grace's pardon, and I hope I had it. This is my fault, 
As for the rest appealed, it, it issued from the rancor of a villain, a recreant and most degenerate traitor, which in myself I boldly will defend, and interchangeably hurl down my gauge upon this overweening traitor's foot, in haste whereof, most heartily I pray, your highness to assign our trial day. Wrath kindled, gentlemen, be ruled by me. Let's purge this collar without letting blood. Forget, forgive. Conclude and be agreed. Our doctors say this is no month to bleed. Good uncle, let this end where it begun. We'll calm the Duke of Norfolk, you, your son. Be a make peace shall become my age. Throw down, my son, the Duke of Norfolk's gauge. And Norfolk, throw down his. When, Harry, when? Obedience bids, I should not bid again. Norfolk, throw down, we bid, there is no boot. Myself I throw, dread sovereign, at thy foot my life. Thou shalt command, but not my shame. I am disgraced, impeached, and baffled here, pierced through the soul with a slanderous venom spear, to which no balm can cure but his heart blood, which breathed this poison. Rage must be withstood. Give me his gauge. Lions make leopards tame. Yea, but not change his spots. Take but my shame, and I resign my gauge, my dear... Dear Lord, the purest treasure mortal times afford is spotless reputation. That away, men are but gilded loam or painted clay. Mine honor is my life. Both grow in one. Take my honor from me, and my life is done. Then, dear my liege, mine honor let me try. In that I live, and for that will I die. Cousin, throw up your gauge. Do you begin? Oh, God, defend my soul from such deep sin. Shall I seem crestfallen in my father's sight, or with pale beggar fear impeach my height? We were not born to sue, but to command, which since we cannot do to make you friends. Be ready, as your lives shall answer it, at Coventry upon St. Lambert's day. There shall your swords and lances arbitrate the swelling difference of your settled hate. Alas, the part I had in Woodstock's blood doth more solicit me than York's claims to stir against the butchers of, of his life. But since correction lieth in those hands which made the fault that we cannot correct, put we our quarrel to the will of heaven, who, when they see the hours ripe on earth, will rain hot vengeance on offenders' heads. Finds brotherhood in thee no sharper spur, hath love in thy old blood no living fire. Edward's seven sons, whereof thyself art one, were as seven vials of his sacred blood, or seven fair branches springing from one root. Some of those seven are dried by nature's course, some of those branches by the destinies cut. But Thomas, my dear lord, my life, my Gloucester, one vial full of Edward's sacred blood, one flourishing branch of his most royal root, is cracked and all the precious liquor spilt is hacked down and his summer leaves all faded by envy's hand and murder's bloody axe o oh, gaunt his blood is thine that bed that womb that metal that self-mold that fashioned thee made him a man and though thou livest and breathest yet art thou slain in him call it not patience gaunt it is despair in suffering thus thy brother to be slaughtered, thou showest the naked pathway to thy life, teaching stern murder how to butcher thee. That which in mean men we entitle patience is pale, cold cowardice in noble breasts. What shall I say? To safeguard thine own life, the best way is to avenge my Gloucester's death. God's is the quarrel, for God's substitute, his deputy, anointed in his sight, hath caused his death, the which, if wrongfully, let heaven revenge. For I may never lift an angry arm against his minister. Where then, alas, may I complain myself? To God, the widow's champion and defense. Why then, I will. Farewell, old gaunt. Thou goest to Coventry there to behold our cousin Hereford and fell Mowbray fight. Oh, sit my husband's wrongs on Hereford's spear, that it may enter butcher Mowbray's breast. Farewell, old gaunt. Thy sometime brother's wife, with her companion grief, must end her life. Sister, farewell. I must to Coventry. As much good stay with thee as go with me. I take my leave before I have begun. 
for sorrow ends not when it seemeth done. Commend me to thy brother, Edmund York. Lo, this is all. Nay, 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 yet depart not so. Though, though this be all, do not so quickly go. I shall remember more. Bid him, oh, what? With all good speed at Plashy visit me, alack. And what shall good old York there see? But empty lodgings and unfurnished walls, unpeopled offices, untrodden stones, and what here there for welcome but my groans? Desolate, desolate will I hence and die, the last leave of thee takes my weeping eye. My lord Omeral, is Harry here for the arm? Yea, at all points, and longs to enter in. The Duke of Norfolk, sprightfully and bold, stays but the summons of the appellant's trumpet. Marshal, demand of yonder champion the cause of his arrival here in arms. In God's name and the king, say who art thou, and why thou comest as knightly clad in arms, against what man thou comest, and what thy quarrel. Speak truly on thy knighthood and thy oath, as so defend thee heaven and thy valor. My name is Thomas Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk, who hither come engaged by my oath both to defend my loyalty and truth to God, my king, and my succeeding issue against the Duke of Hereford that appeals me, and by the grace of God and this mine arm to prove him in defending of myself a traitor to my God, my king, and me. And as I truly fight, defend me heaven. Marshal. Ask yonder knight in arms both who he is and why he cometh hither thus plated in habiliments of war, and formally, according to our law, depose him in the justice of his cause. What is thy name, and wherefore comest thou hither before King Richard in his royal list? Against whom comest thou, and what's thy quarrel? Speak like a true knight, so defend thee heaven. Harry of Hereford, Lancaster, and Derby am I who ready here do stand in arms to prove, by God's grace and my body's valor, in lists on Thomas Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk, that he is a traitor, foul and dangerous, to God of heaven, King Richard, and to me. And as I truly fight, defend me heaven. On pain of death, no person be so bold or daring hardy as to touch the list, except the marshal and such officers appointed to direct these fair designs. Lord Marshal, let me kiss my sovereign's hand, and bow my knee before his majesty. For Mowbray and myself are like two men that vow a long and weary pilgrimage. The appellant in all duty greets your highness, and craves to kiss your hand and take his leave. We will descend and fold him in our arms. Cousin of Hereford, as thy cause is right, so be thy fortune in this royal fight. Farewell, my blood, which today thou shed. Lament we may, but not revenge thee dead. Oh, let no noble eye profane a tear for me, if I be gored with Mowbray's spear. As confident as is the falcon's flight against a bird, do I with Mowbray fight. My loving lord, I take my leave of you. Oh, thou, the earthly author of my blood, add proof unto mine armor with thy prayers, and furbish new the name of John Agant even in the lusty havior of his son. God in thy good cause make thee prosperous. Be swift like lightning in the execution, and let thy blows doubly redoubled fall like amazing thunder on the casks of the adverse pernicious enemy. Rouse up thy youthful blood, be valiant, and live. Mine innocency and St. George to thrive. And however God or fortune cast my lot, there lives or dies true to King Richard's throne, a loyal, just, and upright gentleman. Never did captive with a freer heart cast off his chains of bondage and embrace, his golden uncontrolled enfranchisement, more than my dancing soul doth celebrate this feast of battle with mine adversary. Most mighty liege, and my companion peers, take from my mouth the wish of happy years. As gentle and as jocund as to jest, go I to fight. Truth hath a quiet breast. Order the trial, Marshal, and begin. Harry of Hereford, Lancaster, and Derby stands here for God, his sovereign, and himself, on pain to be found false and recreant to prove. 
remove the Duke of Norfolk, Thomas Mowbray, a traitor to his God, his King, and him, and dares him to set forward to the fight. Here standeth Thomas Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk, on pain to be found false and recreant, both to defend himself and to approve Henry of Hereford, Lancaster, and Derby to God, his sovereign, and to him disloyal, courageously and with a free desire attending but the signal to begin. The king hath thrown his water down. Let them lay by their helmets and their spears, and both return back to their chairs again. Withdraw with us, and let the trumpets sound while we return these dukes what we decree. Draw near, and list what with our counsel we have done. For that our kingdom's earth should not be soiled with that dear blood which it hath fostered, and for our eyes do hate the dire aspect of civil wounds plowed up with neighbor's sword. And for we think the ingle-winged pride of sky-aspiring and ambitious thoughts, with rival-hating envy set on you to wake our peace, which in our country's cradle draws the sweet infant breath of gentle sleep, which so roused with boisterous uptuned drums and harsh resounding trumpets dreadful bray and grating shock of wrathful iron arms might from our quiet confines fright fair peace and make us wade even in our kindred's blood. Therefore, we banish you our territories. You, Cousin Hereford, upon pain of life, till twice five summers have enriched our fields, shall not regret our fair dominions, but tread the stranger paths of banishment. Your will be done. This must my comfort be. The sun that warms you here shall shine on me, and those his golden beams to you here lent shall point on me, and gild my banishment. Norfolk. For thee remains a heavier doom, which I with some unwillingness pronounce. The hopeless word of never to return breathe I against thee upon pain of life. A heavy sentence, my most sovereign liege, and all unlooked for from your highness mouth. In the language I have learned these forty years, my native English, now I must forgo. My tongue's use is to me no more than an unstringed viol or a harp. Within my mouth you have enjailed my tongue, doubly portcullis with my teeth and lips, and dull, unfeeling, barren ignorance has made my jailer to attend on me. I am too old to fawn upon a nurse, too far in years to be a pupil now. What is thy sentence then but speechless death, which robs my tongue from breathing native breath? It boots thee not to be compassionate. After our sentence, plaining comes too late. Thus I turn me from my country's light, to dwell in solemn shades of endless night. Return again, and take an oath with thee. Swear by the duty that you owe to God to keep the oath that we administer. You never shall, so help you truth and God. Embrace each other's love in banishment. Nor never be advised in purpose meet to plot, contrive, or complot any ill against us, our state, our subjects, or our land. I swear. And I to keep all this. Norfolk, so far as to mine enemy, Confess thy treasons ere thou leave the realm. O bowling brook, if ever I were traitor, my name be blotted from the book of life, and I from heaven banished as from hence. But what thou art, God, thou, and I do know, and all too soon I fear the king shall rue. Farewell, my liege. Now no way can I stray, save back to England, 
All the world's my way. Uncle, even in the glasses of thine eyes, I see thy grieved heart. Thy sad aspect hath, from the number of his banished years, plucked four away. Six frozen winter spent, return with welcome home from banishment. How long a time lies in one little word? Four lagging winters and four wanton springs end in a word. Such is the breath of kings. I thank my liege that in regard of me he shortens four years of my son's exile. But little vantage shall I reap thereby, for ere the six years that he hath to spend can change their moons and bring their times about, my oil-dried lamp and time-wasted light shall be extinct with age and endless night. Why, uncle, thou hast many years to live. But not a minute, king, that thou canst give. Thou canst help time to furrow me with age, but stop no wrinkle in his pilgrimage. Thy word is current with him for my death. But dead, thy kingdom cannot buy my breath. Thy son is banished upon good advice, where to thy tongue a party verdict gave. Why, at our justice, seems thou then to lower? Things sweet to taste prove in digestion sour. You urged me as a judge, but I had rather you would have bid me argue like a father. Alas, I looked when some of you should say I was too strict to make my known away. But you gave leave to my unwilling tongue against my will to do myself this wrong. Cousin, farewell. An uncle bid him so. Six years we banish him, and he shall go. What is six winters? They are quickly gone. To men in joy, but grief makes one hour ten. Call it travel that thou takest for pleasure. My heart will sigh when I miscall it so, which finds it an enforced pilgrimage. Solid passage of thy weary steps esteem as foil wherein thou art set the precious jewel of thy home return. Nay, rather every tedious stride I make will but remember me what a deal of world I wander from the jewels that I love. Must I not serve a long apprenticehood to foreign passages, and in the end, having my freedom, boast of nothing else but that I was a journeyman to grief? All places that the eye of heaven visits are, to a wise man, ports and happy havens. Teach thy necessity to reason thus. There is no virtue like necessity. Think not the king did banish thee, but thou the king. Woe doth the heavier sit where it perceives it is but faintly born. Go, say I sent thee forth to purchase honor, and not the king exile thee. Or suppose devouring pestilence hangs in our air, and thou art flying to fresher clime. Look, what thy soul holds dear, imagine it to lie that way that thou goest, not whence thou comest. Suppose the singing birds musicians, the flowers fair ladies, and thy steps no more than a delightful measure or a dance. For gnarling sorrow hath less power to bite the man that mocks it and sets it light. Oh, who can hold a fire in his hand by thinking on the frosty Caucasus, or cloy the hungry edge of appetite by bare imagination of a feast? Oh no, the apprehension of the good gives but the greater feeling to the worse. Come, my son, I'll bring thee on thy way. Had I thy youth and cause, I would not stay. And England's ground, farewell. Sweet soil, adieu. My mother and my nurse that bears me yet. Where'er I wander, boast of this I can. Though banished, yet a true-born Englishman. Observe. Cousin Omer, how far brought you High Hereford on his way? Well, I brought High Hereford, if you call him so, but to the next highway, and there I left him. What said our cousin when you parted with him? Farewell. Mary, would the word farewell have lengthened hours and added years to his short banishment? He should have had a volume of farewells, but since it would not, he had none of me. He is our cousin, cousin. 
But tis doubt, when time shall call him home from banishment, whether our kinsmen come to see his friends. Ourself, Bushy, Bagot here, and Green, observed his courtship to the common people. How he did seem to dive into their hearts with humble and familiar courtesy. Off goes his bonnet to an oyster wench. A brace of draymen bid God speed him well, and had the tribute of his supple knee with thanks, my countrymen, my loving friends, as were our England in reversion his, and he our subjects next degree in hope. Well, he is gone, and with him go these thoughts. Now, for the rebels which stand out in Ireland, expedient manage must be made, my liege, ere further leisure yield them further means for their advantage and your highness loss. We will ourselves in person to this war. And for our coffers, with too great a court and liberal largesse are grown somewhat light, we are enforced to farm our royal realm. The revenue whereof shall furnish us for our affairs in hand. If that comes short, our substitutes at home shall have blank charters. Whereto, when they shall know what men are rich, they shall subscribe them for large sums of gold and send them after to supply our wants. For we will make for Ireland presently. Bushy, what news? Old John of Gaunt is grievous sick, my lord. Suddenly taken, hath sent post haste to entreat your majesty to visit him. Now put it God in the physician's mind to help him to his grave immediately. The lining of his coffers shall make coats to deck our soldiers for these Irish wars. Come, gentlemen, let's all go visit him. Pray God we make haste and come too late. Amen. Will the king come that I may breathe my last in wholesome counsel to his unstayed youth? Vex not yourself, nor strive not with your breath, for all in vain comes counsel to his ear. Oh, but they say the tongues of dying men enforce attention like deep harmony. Where words are scarce, they are seldom spent in vain, for they breathe truth that breathe their words of pain. <laughs> he that no more must say is listened more than they whom youth and ease have taught to glows. More are men's ends marked than their lives before. The setting sun and the music at the close as the last taste of sweets is sweetest last, writ in remembrance more than things long past. Though Richard my life's counsel would not hear, my death's sad tale may yet undeaf his ear. No, it has stopped with other flattering sounds. <laughs> as praises of whose taste the wiser fond, lascivious meters to whose venom sound the open ear of youth doth always listen. Then all too late comes counsel to be heard, where will doth mutiny with wit's regard. Direct not him whose way himself will choose, tis breath thou lacks, and that breath wilt thou lose. Thinks I am a prophet new inspired, and thus expiring do foretell of him. His rash, fierce blaze of riot cannot last, for violent fires soon burn out themselves. Small showers last long, but sudden storms are short. This royal throne of kings, this sceptered isle, this earth of majesty, the seat of Mars, this other Eden demi-paradise, this fortress built by nature for herself against infection and the hand of war, this blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England, this land of such dear souls, this dear, dear land, dear for her reputation through the world is now least out. I die pronouncing it like to a tenement or pelting farm. England, bound in with a triumphant sea whose rocky shores beats back the envious siege of watery Neptune is now bound in with shame with inky blots and rotten parchment bonds. That England that was wont to conquer others hath made a shameful conquest of itself. Oh, would the scandal vanish with my life? How happy then were my ensuing death. The king has come. Deal mildly with his youth, for young hot coals being raged do rage the more. Affairs are 
proud noble uncle Lancaster. Of comfort, man. How is with aged gaunt? For sleeping England long time have I watched. Watching breeds leanness. Leanness is all gaunt. The pleasure that some fathers feed upon is my strict fast. I mean my children's looks. And there in fasting have made me gaunt. Gaunt am I for the grave. Gaunt as a grave, whose hollow womb inherits not but bones. Can sick men play so nicely with their names? No. Misery makes sport to mock itself. Since thou dost seek to kill my name in me, I mock my name, great king, to flatter thee. Should dying men flatter with those that live? No. No. Men living flatter those that die. Thou, now a dying, sayst thou flatterest me. Oh, no. Thou diest, though I the sicker be. I am in health. I breathe and see thee ill. Now he that made me knows I see thee ill. Ill in myself to see, and in thee seeing ill. Thy deathbed is no lesser than thy land, wherein thou liest in reputation sick. A thousand flatterers sit within thy crown, whose compass is no bigger than thy head. And yet, encaged in so small a verge, the waste is no whit lesser than thy land. Oh, had thy grandsire with a prophet's eye seen how his son's son should destroy his sons, from forth thy reach he would have laid thy shame, deposing thee before thou wert possessed, which art possessed now to depose thyself. Why, cousin, wert thou regent of the world, it were a shame to let this land by lease. But for thy world enjoying but this land, it is not more than shame to shame it so. Landlord of England art thou now, not king. Thy state of law is bond slave to the law, and thou... A lunatic, lean-witted fool, presuming on an Agu's privilege, darest with thy frozen admonition make pale our cheek, chasing the royal blood with fury from his native residence. Now by my seat's right royal majesty, wert thou not brother to great Edward's son, this tongue that runs so roundly in thy head should run thy head from thy unreverent shoulders. Oh, spare me not, my brother Edward's son, for that I was his father Edward's son. That blood already, like the pelican, hath thou tapped out and drunkenly caroused. And thy unkindness be like crooked age to crop at once a too long withered flower. Live in thy shame, but die not shame with thee. These words hereafter thy tormentors be. <laughs> Convey me to my bed and then to my grave. Love they to live that love and honor have. Then die the age and sullens have, for both hast thou, and both become the grave. I do beseech your majesty, impute his words to wayward sickliness and age in him. He loves you on my life, and hold you dear as, Her as Harry, Duke of Hereford, were he here. Right. You say true. As Hereford's love, so his. As theirs, so mine. And all be as it is. My liege, old God commends him to your majesty. What says he? I know nothing. All is said, his tongue is now a stringless instrument, words, life, and all old Lancaster had spent. Be York the next that must be bankrupt so. Though death be poor, it ends a mortal woe. The ripest fruit first falls, and so doth he. His time is spent. Our pilgrimage must be. So much for that. Now, for our Irish wars, we must supplant those rough, rug-headed kerns which like live venom, where no venom else, but only they have privilege to live. And for these great affairs do ask some charge. Towards our assistance we do seize to us the plate, corn, revenues, and movables, whereof our Uncle Gaunt did stand possessed. How long shall I be patient? Oh, how long shall tender duty make me suffer wrong? Not Gloucester's death, nor Hereford's banishment, not Gaunt's rebukes, nor England's private wrongs have ever made me sour my patient cheek 
or been one wrinkle on my sovereign's face. I am the last of noble Edward's sons, of whom thy father, Prince of Wales, was first. In war was never lion raged more fierce, in peace was never gentle lamb more, wat more mild than was that young and princely gentleman. <laughs> His face thou hast, for even so looked he accomplished with the number of thy hours. But when he frowned, it was against the French, and not against his friends. His noble hand did will what he did spin, and spin not that which his triumphant father's hand had won. His hands were guilty of no kindred blood, but bloody with the enemies of his kin. Oh, Richard, York is too far gone with grief, or else he never would compare between. Why, uncle, what's the matter? Seek you to seize and gripe into your hands the royalties and rights of banished Hereford? Is not Gaunt dead? And doth not Hereford live? Was not Gaunt just and is not Harry true? Take Hereford's rights away and take from time his charters and his customary rights. Let not tomorrow then ensue today. Be not thyself, for how art thou a king but by fair sequence and succession? Now, afore God, God forbid I say true, if you do wrongly seize Hereford's rights, you pluck a thousand dangers on your head. You lose a thousand well-disposed hearts and prick my tender patience to those thoughts which honor and allegiance cannot think. Think what you will. We seize into our hands his plate, his goods, his money, and his lands. I will not be the while. My liege, farewell. What will ensue hereof, there's none can tell. But by bad courses may be understood that their events can never fall out good. Go, Bushy, to the Earl of Wiltshire Strait. Bid him repair to us to Eli House to see this business. Tomorrow next, we will for Ireland, and tis time I trow, and we create, in absence of ourself, our Uncle York, Lord Governor of England. For he is just, and always loved us well. Tomorrow must we part. Be merry, for our time of stay is short. Well, lords, the Duke of Lancaster is dead. And living too, for now his son is Duke. Fairly in title, not in revenue. Richly in both, if justice had her right. My heart is great, but it must break with silence ere to be disburdened with a liberal tongue. Ah, speak thy mind, and let him there speak more that speaks thy words again to do thee harm. Tends that thou would speak to the Duke of Hereford. If it be so, out with it boldly, man, quick as mine ear to hear of good towards him. Oh, no good at all that I can do for him unless you call it good to pity him, bereft and gilded of his patrimony. Now, for God, to shame such wrongs are born in him, a royal prince and many more of noble blood in this declining land. The king is not himself, but basely led by flatterers. And what they will inform merely in hate against any of us all, that will the king severely prosecute against us, our lives, our children, and our heirs. The commons hath he paled with grievous taxes and quite lost their hearts. The nobles hath he fined for ancient quarrels and quite lost their hearts. And daily new exactions are devised as, as blanks and benevolences and I what not what. But what a God's name doth become of this? Wars have not wasted it, for worried he hath not but barely yielded upon compromise that which his noble ancestors achieved with blows. More hath he spent in peace than in wars. The Earl of Wiltshire hath the realm in far. The king's grown bankrupt, like a broken man. Reproach and dissolution hangeth over him. He hath not money for these Irish wars, his burdenous taxations notwithstanding, but by the robbing of the banished duke. Noble kingsman, a most degenerate king. But lords, 
We hear this fearful tempest sing, yet we see no shelter to avoid the storm. We see the very wreck that we must suffer, and unavoided is the danger now, for suffering so the causes of our wreck. Not so. Even through the hollow eyes of death, I spy little life bearing, but I dare not say how near the tidings of our comfort is. Nay, let us show thy thoughts as thou dost ours. Be confident to speak, Northumberland. We three are but thyself, and speaking so, thy words are but as thoughts. Therefore, be bold. And thus, I have received intelligence that Harry, Duke of Hereford, his brother, Archbishop Late of Canterbury, Sir Thomas Eppingham, Sir John Ramston, and others, well furnished by the Duke of Bretignard, are making hither with all due expedience and shortly mean to touch our northern shore. Perhaps they'll air this, but that they stay the first departing of the king for Ireland. If then we shall shake off our slavish yoke, imp out our drooping country's broken wing, redeem from broken pawn the blemished crown, and make high majesty look like itself, away with me and poster Ravingspur. But if you faint, as fearing to do so, then stay and be secret, and I myself will go. To horse, to horse, urge doubts to them that fear. Hold out my horse and I will first be there. Your majesty is too much sad. You promised when you parted with the king to lay aside life-harming heaviness and entertain a cheerful disposition. To please the king I did, to please myself, I, I cannot do it. Yet I know no cause why I should welcome such a guest as grief, save bidding farewell to so sweet a guest as my sweet Richard. Yet again, me sing some Unborn sorrows, ripe in, in fortune's womb, is coming towards me, and my inward soul with nothing trembles. At some thing it grieves more than with parting from my lord the king. Each substance of a grief hath twenty shadows, which shows like grief itself, but is not so. For sorrow's eye, glazed with blinding tears, divides one thing entire to many objects, like Perspectives, which rightly gazed upon, show nothing but confusion. I'd awry distinguish form. God save your majesty, and well met gentlemen. I hope the king is not yet shipped for Ireland. Why, opest thou so? Tis better hope he is, for his designs crave haste, his haste good hope. Then wherefore dost thou hope he is not shipped? that he, our hope, might have retired his power and driven into despair an enemy's hope, who strongly hath set footing in this land. The banished Bolingbroke repeals himself and with uplifted arms is safely arrived at Ravensburg. Oh, now God in heaven forbid. Ah, uh, madam, tis too true, and that is worse. The Lord Northumberland, his son, young Henry Percy, the Lords of Ross, Bowmond, and Willoughby, with all their powerful friends are fled to him. Why have you not proclaimed Northumberland and all the rest revolted faction traitors? We have, whereupon the Earl of Worcester hath broke his staff, resigned his stewardship, and all the household servants fled with him to Bolingbroke. So, Green, thou art the midwife to my woe, and Bolingbroke my sorrow's dismal air. Despair not, madam. I will despair, and be at enmity with Cousining hope, he is a flatterer, a parasite, a, a keeper back of death, who gently would dissolve the bands of life which false hope lingers in extremity. Uncle, for God's sake, speak comfortable words. Should I do so, I should belie my thoughts. Comforts in heaven and we are on the earth where nothing lives but crosses, cares, and grief. Your husband, he is gone to say far off whilst others come to make him lose at home. Here am I, left to underprop his land, who 
weak with age, cannot support myself. Now comes a sick hour that his surfeit made. Now shall he try his friends that flattered him. My lord, your son was gone before I came. He was? Why so? Go all which way it will. The nobles, they have fled. The commons, they are cold and will, I fear, revolt on Hereford's side. Sirrah, get thee to Plashy, to my sister Gloucester. Bid her send me presently a thousand pound. My lord, I had forgot to tell your lordship. Today, as I came by, I called there. But an hour before I came, the Duchess died. God, for his mercy. What a tide of woes comes rushing on this woeful land at once. I know not what to do. I would to God so my untruth had not provoked him too, but the king had cut off my head with my brothers. What, are there no post dispatch for Ireland? How shall we do for money for these wars? Come, sister, cousin, I would say, pray, pardon me. Go, fellow, get thee home. If I know how or which way to what order these affairs, thus thrust disorderly into my hands, never believe me. Both are my kinsmen, the one is my sovereign, whom both my oath and duty bids defend. The other again is my kinsman, whom the king hath wronged, whom conscience and my kindred bids to right. Well, somewhat we must do. Gentlemen, go muster up your men and meet me presently at Berkeley. I should to Plashy too, but time will not permit. All is uneven and everything is left at six and seven. Wind sits fair for news to go to Ireland, but none returns. For us to levy power proportionable to the enemy is all impossible. Besides, our nearness to the king in love is near the hate of those love not the king. And that's the wavering commons. For their love lies in their purses, and whoso empties them by so much fills their hearts with deadly hate. Wherein the king stands generally condemned. If judgment lie in them, then so do we, because we ever have been near the king. Well, I will for refuge straight to Bristol Castle. The Earl of Wiltshire is already there. Thither will I with you. Will you go along with us? No. I will to Ireland to his majesty. Farewell. If heart's presages be not vain, we three here art that ne'er shall meet again. That's as York thrives to beat back Bolingbroke. Alas, poor Duke. The task he, the task he undertakes is, is, is numbering sands and drinking oceans dry. Where one on his side fights, thousands will fly. Farewell. At once, for once, for all, and ever. How far is it, my lord, to Berkeley now? Oh, believe me, noble lord, I'm a stranger here to Gloucester. And the high hills, wild hills, and rough and even ways draws out our miles and makes them wearisome. And yet your fair discourse hath been as sugar, making the hard way sweet and mwah, delectable. But I bethink me, what a weary way. Of much less value as my company than your good words. But who comes here? Oh, it is my son, young Harry Percy, sent from my brother Worcester, whensoever. Harry, how fares your uncle? I had thought, my lord, to have learned his health of you. Why, is he not with the queen? No, my good lord, he hath forsook the court, broken his staff of office, and dispersed the household of the king. What was his reason? He was not so resolved when last we spake together. Because your lord's ship was proclaimed a traitor, but he, my lord, is gone to Ravenspur to offer service to the Duke of Hereford, and sent me over by Berkeley to discover what power the Duke of York hath levied there, then with directions to repair to Ravenspur. Have you forgot the Duke of Hereford, boy? <clears throat> no, my good lord, for that is not forgot which ne'er I did remember. <laughs> to my knowledge, I never in my life did look on him. Then... Learn to know him now. This is the Duke. Ah, my gracious Lord, I tender you my service, such as it is, being tender, raw, and young, which elder days shall ripen and confirm to more approved service and desert. 
I thank thee, gentle Percy, and be sure I count myself in nothing else so happy as in a soul remembering my good friends. And as my fortune ripens with thy love, it shall be still thy true love's recompense. My heart this covenant makes, my hand thus seals it. How far is it to Berkeley? And what still keeps good old York there with his men of war? Well, there stands the castle by yon tuft of trees, manned with three hundred men, as I have heard, and in it are the lords of York, Berkeley, and Seymour, none else of name or noble estimate. Oh, look, here come the lords of Ross and Willoughby. Welcome, my lords. I wot your love pursues a banished traitor. All my treasury is yet but unfelt thanks, which more enriched shall be your love and labor's recompense. Your presence makes us rich, most noble lord. And far surmounts the labor to attain it. Never more thanks, the exchequer of the poor, which till my infant fortune comes to years, stands for my bounty. But who comes here? My noble uncle York. Show me thy humble heart and not thy knee, whose duty is deceivable and false. My gracious uncle. Uh... Tut, tut. Grace me no grace, nor uncle me no uncle. I am no traitor's uncle. And that word grace in an ungracious mouth is but profane. Why have those banished and forbidden legs dared once to touch a dust of England's ground? But then more, why? Why have they dared to march so many miles upon her peaceful bosom, frighting her pale-faced villages with war and ostentation of despised arms? Comes thou because the anointed king is hence? Why, foolish boy! The king is left behind, and in my loyal bosom lies his power. Were I but now the lord of such hot youth as when brave God thy father and myself rescued the black prince, that young Mars of men from forth the ranks of many thousand French, oh, then how quickly should this arm of mine, now prisoner to the palsy, chastise thee and minister correction to thy fault. My gracious uncle, let me know my fault. On what condition stands it, and wherein? Even in condition of the worst degree, in gross rebellion and detested treason, thou art a banished man. And here art come, before the expiration of thy time, in braving arms against thy sovereign. As I was banished, I was banished Hereford. But as I come, I come for Lancaster. Noble uncle, I beseech your grace, look on my wrongs with an indifferent eye. If that my cousin king be king of England, it must be granted I am Duke of Lancaster. I am denied to sue my livery here. My father's goods are all distrained and sold, and these and all are all misemployed. What would you have me do? I am a subject, and I challenge law. Attorneys are denied me, therefore personally I lay my claim to my inheritance of free descent. The noble duke hath been too much abused. And your grace upon to do him right. Base men by his endowments are made great. The noble duke hath sworn his coming is but for his own, and for the right of that we all have strongly sworn to give him aid. And let him ne'er see joy that breaks that oath. Well, well, I see the issue of these arms. I cannot mend it, I must needs confess, because my power is weak and all ill left. But if I could, by him that gave me life, I would attach you all and make you stoop unto the sovereign mercy of the king. But since I cannot be it known to you, I do remain as neuter. So fare you well. Unless you please to enter in the castle and there reposed you for this night. Offer, uncle, that we will accept. But we must win your grace to go with us to Bristol Castle, which they say is held by Bushy, Bagot, and their complices, the caterpillars of the Commonwealth, which I have sworn to weed and pluck away. It may be I will go with you, but yet I'll pause, for I am loath to break our country's laws. Nor friends nor foes, to me welcome you are. Things past redress are now with me past care. Bring forth these men, bushy and green. 
and will not vex your souls, since presently your souls must part your bodies with too much urging your pernicious lives for to no charity. Yet, to wash your blood from off my hands, here in the view of men I will unfold some causes of your deaths. You have misled a prince, a royal king, a happy gentleman in blood and lineaments, by you unhappied and disfigured clean. You have in manner with your sinful hours made a divorce betwixt his queen and him, broke the possession of a royal bed, and stained the beauty of a fair queen's cheeks with tears drawn from her eyes by your foul wrongs. Myself, a prince of fortune by my birth, near to the king in blood and near in love, till you did make him misinterpret me, have stooped my neck under your injuries, and sighed my English breath in foreign clouds, eating the bitter bread of banishment, whilst you have fed upon my signories, disparked my parks, felled my forest woods, from my own windows torn my household coat, raised out my impress, leaving me no sign, save men's opinions and my living blood, to show the world I am a gentleman. This and much more, much more than twice all this, condemns you to the death. See them delivered over to execution in the hand of death. More welcome is the stroke of death to me than Bolingbroke to England. Lords, farewell. My comfort is that heaven will take our souls and plague injustice with all the pains of hell. My Lord Northumberland, see them dispatched. <clears throat> Come, lords, away, to fight with Glen Dower and his accomplices. A while to work and after holiday. Our cloth the castle call they this at hand. Yea, my lord. How brooks your grace the air after your late tossing on the breaking seas? Needs must I like it well. I weep for joy to stand upon my kingdom once again. Dear earth, I do salute thee with my hand, though rebels wound thee with their horses' hoofs. As a long-parted mother with her child plays fondly with her tears and smiles in meeting, so weeping, smiling, greet I thee, my earth, and do thee favors with my royal hands. Feed not thy sovereign's foe, my gentle earth, nor with thy sweet comforts his ravenous sense. Guard it! I pray thee with a lurking adder whose double tongue may with a mortal touch throw death upon thy sovereign's enemies. Fear not, my lord. That power that made you king hath power to keep you king in spite of all. The means that heaven yields must be embraced and not neglected. Else, if heaven would, and we will not, heaven's offer we refuse, the proffered means of succor and redress. He means, my lord, that we are too remiss, whilst Bolingbroke, through our security, grows strong and great in substance and in power. His comfortable cousin, know so not that when the searching eye of heaven is hid behind the globe that lights the lower world, then thieves and robbers range abroad unseen in murders and in outrage boldly here, but... But when from under this terrestrial ball he fires the proud tops of the eastern pines and darts his light through every guilty hole, then murders, treasons, and undetested sins, the cloak of night being plucked from off their backs, stand bare and naked, trembling at themselves. So when this thief, this traitor, this bowling brook, who all this while hath reveled in the night whilst we were wandering with the Antipodes, shall see us rising in our throne, the east. His treasons will sit blushing in his face, not able to endure the sight of day, but self-affrighted tremble at his sin. Now all the water in the rough rude sea can wash the balm from an anointed king. The breath of worldly men cannot depose the deputy elected by the Lord. 
For every man that Bolingbroke hath pressed to lift shrewd steel against our golden crown, God, for his Richard, hath in heavenly pay a glorious angel. Then, if angels fight, weak men must fall. For heaven still guards the right. Welcome, my lord. How far off lies your power? Nor near, nor farther off, my gracious lord, than this weak arm. Discomfort guides my tongue and bids me speak of nothing but despair. One day too late, I fear me, noble lord, hath clouded all thy happy days on earth. Oh, call back yesterday. Bid time return, and thou shalt have twelve thousand fighting men. For all the Welshmen, hearing thou wert dead, are gone to Bolingbroke, dispersed and fled. Comfort, my liege, why looks your grace so pale? Now the blood of twenty thousand men did triumph in my face, and they are fled. Until so much blood thither come again, have I not reason to look pale and dead? All souls that will be safe fly from my side, for time hath set a blot upon my pride. Comfort, my liege. Remember who you are. I have forgot myself. Am I not king? Awake. Awake, thou coward majesty, thou sleepest. Is not the king's name twenty thousand names? Arm, arm my name. A puny subject strikes at thy great glory. Look not to the ground, ye favorites of a king. Are we not high, high be our thoughts? I know my uncle York hath power enough to serve our turn. But who comes here? More health and happiness betide my leash, and can my care tongue deliver him? Mine ear is open and my heart prepared. The worst is worldly loss thou canst unfold. Say, is my kingdom lost? Why? Twas my care, and what loss is it to be rid of care? Cry woe, destruction, ruin, and decay. The worst is death, and death will have his day. Glad am I that your highness is so armed to bear the tidings of calamity like an unseasonable stormy day which makes the silver rivers drown their shores as if the world were dissolved to tears so high above his limits swells the rage of Bolingbroke, covering your fearful land with hard bright steel and hearts harder than steel white beards have armed their thin and hairless scalps against thy majesty both young and old rebel and all goes worse than I have power to t tell. Well, too well, thou test the tale so ill. Where is the Earl of Wiltshire? Where is Bagot? What has become of but where is Green? I warrant they have made peace with Bolingbroke. Peace they have made with him, indeed, my lord. Oh. Oh. Villains! Vipers damned without redemption, dogs easily won to fawn on any man, snakes in my heart blood worm that stink my heart. Three Judases, each one thrice worse than Judas. Could they make peace? Terrible hell make war upon their spotted souls for this offense. Again, uncurse their souls. Their peace is made with heads and not with hands. Those whom you curse have felt the worst of deaths, destroying wound and lie full low, graved in the hollow ground. Where is the Duke, my father, with his power? No matter where. Of comfort no man speak. Let's talk of graves. Of worms and epitaphs. Make dust our paper, and with rainy eyes write sorrow on the bosom of the earth. Let's choose execute and talk of wills. 
and yet not so, for what can we bequeath save our deposed bodies to the ground? Our lands, our lives, and all our bowling brooks. And nothing can we call our own but death, and that small model of the barren earth which serves as paste and cover to our bones. Oh, for God's sake. Let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings. How some have been deposed, some slain in war, some haunted by the ghosts they have deposed, some poisoned by their wives, some sleeping killed, all murdered. For within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temples of a king keeps death's court. And there the antic sits, scoffing his state and grinning at his pomp, allowing him a breath, a little scene, to monarchize, be feared and kill with looks, infusing him with self and vain conceit as if this flesh which walls about our life were brass impregnable. And humor thus comes at the last with a little pin, bores through his castle wall, and farewell, king! Cover your heads, and mock not flesh and blood with solemn reverence. Throw away respect, tradition, form, and ceremonious duty, for you have but mistook me all this while. I, I live with bread like you, feel want, Taste, grief, need, friends. Subjected thus, how can you say to me I am a king? My lord, wise men ne'er sit and wail their woes, but presently prevent the ways to wail. My father hath a power. Inquire of him and learn to make a body of a limb. <laughs> thou chits me well. Proud Bolingbrook, I come to charge blows with thee for our day of doom. Say, Scroop, where lies our uncle with his power? Speak sweetly, man, although thy looks be sour. <laughs> I play the torturer by small and small to lengthen out the worst that must be spoken. Your uncle York is joined with Bolingbrook, and all your northern castles yielded up, and all your southern gentlemen in arms upon his party. Thou hast said enough. Shrew thee, cousin. Which leads me forth to that sweet way I was I in despair. What say you now? What comfort have we now? By heaven, I'll hate him everlastingly that bids me be of comfort anymore. Go to Flint Castle. There I'll pine away. A king, woe slave, shall kingly woe obey. The power I have discharged, let them go to ear the land that hath some hope to grow, for I have none. Let no man speak again to alter this, for counsel is but vain. My liege, one word. He does me double wrong that wounds me with the flatteries of his tongue. Discharge my followers. Let them hence away from Richard's night to Bolingbroke's fair day. The news is very fair and good, my lord. Richard, not far from hence, hath hit his head. It would beseem the Lord Northumberland to say King Richard. Or lack the heavy day when such a sacred king should hide his head. Mistake not, uncle, further than you should. Take not, good cousin, further than you should, lest your mistake the heavens are o'er our heads. I know it, uncle, and oppose not myself against their will. Welcome, Harry. 
What will not this castle yield? Castle royally is man, my lord, against thy entrance. Royally? Well, it contains no king. Yes, my good lord, it doth contain a king. King Richard lies within the limits of yon lime and stone, and with him are Lord Dormerle, Lord Salisbury, Sir Stephen Scroop, besides a clergyman of holy reverence, who I cannot learn. Noble lords, go to the rude ribs of that ancient castle. Through brazen trumpets send the breath of parley into his ruined ears, and thus deliver. Henry Bolingbroke on both his knees doth kiss King Richard's hand, and sends allegiance and true faith of heart to his most royal person, Hither come even at his feet to lay my arms in power, provided that my banishment repealed and lands restored again be freely granted. If not, I'll use the advantage of my power and lay the summer's dust with showers of blood rain from the wounds of slaughtered Englishmen. The which, how far off from the mind of Bolingbroke it is, such crimson tempest should be drench the fresh green lap of fair King Richard's land my stooping duty tenderly shall show. Go, signify as much, while here we march upon the grassy carpet of this plain. Let's march without the noise of threatening drum, that from this castle's tattered battlements our fair appointments may be well perused. Methinks King Richard and myself should meet with no less terror than the elements of fire and water, when their thundering shock at meeting tears the cloudy cheeks of heaven. Be he the fire, I'll be the yielding water. The rage be his, lest on the earth I rain my waters. On the earth, not on him. March on, and mark King Richard how he looks. We are amazed. And thus long have we stood to watch the fearful bending of thy knee, because we thought ourselves thy lawful king. And if we be, how dare thy joints forget to pay their awful duty to our presence? If we be not, show us the hand of God that hath dismissed us from our stewardship. For well we know no hand of blood and bone can gripe the sacred handle of our scepter, unless he do profane, steal or usurp. And though you think that all, as you have done, have torn their soul by turning them from us, and we are barren and bereft of friends, yet know my master, God omnipotent, is mustering in his clouds on our behalf armies of pestilence, and they shall strike your children, yet unborn and unbegot, that lift your vassal hands against my head and threat the glory of my precious crown. Tell Bolingbroke, for yon methinks he stands, that every stride he makes upon my land is dangerous treason. He is come to open the purple testament of bleeding war, but ere the crown he looks for live in peace. Ten thousand bloody crowns of mother's sons shall ill become the flower of England's face. Charge the complexion of her maid pale peace to scarlet indignation and bedew her pastures grass with faithful English blood. King of heaven forbid our lord the king should so with civil and uncivil arms be rushed upon. Thy twice noble cousin Harry Bolingbroke doth humbly kiss thy hand and by the honorable tomb he swears that stands upon your royal grandsire's bones his coming hither had no further scope than for his lineal royalties and to beg enfranchisement immediate on his knees, which on thy royal party granted once his glittering arms he will commend to rust, his barbed steeds to stables, and his hearth to faithful service of your majesty. Northumberland. Say thus the king returns. His noble cousin is right welcome hither, and all the number of his fair demands shall be accomplished without contradiction, with all the gracious utterance thou hast. Speak to his gentle hearing, kind commence. Till time 
Lend friends and friends their helpful swords. Oh, God. God. That ere this tongue of mine that laid the sentence of dread banishment on yon proud mountain should take it off again with words of sooth. That I were as great as is my grief, or lesser than my name. Or that I could forget what I have been. Or not remember what I must be now. Northumberland comes back from Bolingbrook. What must the king do now? Must he submit? The king shall do it. Must he be deposed? The king shall be contented. Must he lose the name of king? Oh, God's name, let it go. I'll give my jewels for a set of beads. My gorgeous palace for a hermitage. My gay apparel for an almsman's gown, my figured goblets for a dish of wood, my, my scepter for a palmer's walking staff, my subjects for a pair of carved saints, and my large kingdom for a little grave, a little, little grave, an obscure grave. Or I'll be buried in the king's highway, some way of common trade where hourly subjects' feet may hourly trample on their sovereign's head, for on my heart they tread now while I live. And buried once, why not upon my head? <sighs> oh, Merle, thou <laughs> weepest. My tender hearted cousin. <laughs> we'll make foul weather with despised tears. Our sighs, and they shall lodge the summer corn, and make a dearth in this revolting land. Or shall we play the wanton with our woes and make some, some pretty match with shedding tears? Most mighty prince, my lord Northumberland, what says King Bolingbroke? Will his majesty give Richard leave to live till Richard die? You make a leg, and Bolingbroke says, I. Uh, no, my lord, in the base court he doth attend to speak with you. May it please you to come down. Down? Down I come. My glistering phaeton, wanting the manage of unruly jades. <laughs> in the base court. Base court where kings grow base to come at traitors' calls and do them grace in the base court. Come down, down court, down king. For night owls shriek where mounting larks should sing. What says his majesty? Oh, sorrow and grief of heart makes him speak fondly like a frantic man. Oh, yet he is come. Stand all apart and show fair duty to his majesty. My gracious lord. Yeah, cousin, you debase your princely need to make the base earth proud with kissing it. Me rather had my heart might feel your love than my unpleased eye see your courtesy. Up! Cousin, up! Your heart is up, I know. Thus I at least, although your knee be low. My gracious lord, I come but for mine own. Your own is yours. And I am yours. And all. So far be mine, my most redoubted lord, as my true service shall deserve your love. Well, you deserve. They well deserve to have and know the strongest and surest way to get. Uncle, give me your hands. May I dry your eyes, tears show their love, but want their remedies. Cousin, I am too young to be your father though you are old enough to be my heir. What you will have, I'll give, and willing to, for do we must what force will have us do. 
Set on towards London, cousin, is it so? Yea, my good lord. Then I must not say no. Now, Bagot, freely speak thy mind. What thou dost know of noble Gloucester's death, who wrought it with the king, and who performed the bloody office of his timeless end. And set before my face the Lord O'Murrow. Cousin, stand forth, and look upon that man. My Lord O'Murrow, I know your daring tongue scorns to unsay what once it hath delivered. In that dead time, when Gloucester's death was plotted, I heard you say, Is not my arm of length that reacheth from the restful English court as far as Calais to mine uncle's head? Amongst much other talk that very time, I heard you say that you had rather refused the offer of an hundred thousand crowns than Bolingbroke's return to England, adding withal how blessed this land would be in this your cousin's death. I, princes and noble lords, what answer shall I make to this base man? Shall I so much dishonor my fair stars on equal terms to give him chastisement? Either I must, or have mine honor soiled with the attainder of his slanderous lips. There is my gauge, the manual seal of death that marks thee out for hell. I say thou liest, and will maintain what thou hast said in the, is false in thy heart blood though being all too base to stain the temper of my knightly sword. Bag it, forbear, thou shalt not take it up. Excepting one, I would he were the best in all this presence that hath moved me so. If that thy valor stand on sympathy, there is my gauge, Omro, and gauge to thine. I heard thee say, and vauntingly thou spakest it, that thou wert cause of noble Gloucester's death. If thou deniest it twenty times, thou liest and I will turn thy falsehood to thy heart where it was forged with my rapier's point. Thou darest not, coward, live to see that day. Now by my soul, I would have were this hour. Fitzwater, thou art damned to hell for this. Merle, thou liest. His honor is as true in this appeal as thou art all unjust. And that thou art so, there I throw my gauge. Prove it on thee to the extremest point of mortal breathing. Seize it, if thou darest. And if I do not, may my hands rot off, and never brandish more revengeful steel over the glittering helmet of my foe. I task the earth to the light forsworn overall, and spur thee on with full as many lies as may be hollered in thy treacherous ear from sun to sun. There is my honest pawn. Engage it to the trial, if thou darest. Who sets me else? By heaven, I'll throw it all. I have a thousand spirits in one breast to answer twenty thousand such as you. My lord Fitzwater, I do remember well the very time O'Merle and you did talk. Tis very true, you were in presence then, and you can witness with me this is true. As false by heaven as heaven itself is true. Surely thou liest. Dishonorable boy. That lie shall lie so heavy on my sword that it shall render revenge and vengeance till thou the lie giver and that lie do lie in earth as quiet as thy father's skull. In proof whereof, there is my honor's pawn. Engage it to the trial if thou darest. How fondly dost thou spur a forward horse? As I intend to thrive in this new world, Omeril is guilty of my true appeal. Besides, I heard the Baroness Norfolk say that thou, Omeril, didst send two of thy men to execute the noble Duke of Calais. Some honest Christian trust me with the gauge that Norfolk lies. Here I do throw down this, if he may be repealed, to try his honor. These differences shall all rest under gauge till Norfolk be repealed. Repealed he shall be, and though mine enemy, restored again to all his lands and seigneuries. When he's returned... Against Omeril we will enforce his trial. That honorable day shall ne'er be seen. Why, Bishop, is Norfolk dead? As surely as I live, my lord. <sighs> sweet peace conduct his sweet soul to the bosom of good old Abraham. Lord's appellants, your differences shall all rest under gauge till we assign you your days of trial. Great Duke of Lancaster, I come to thee from Plume Plucked Richard, who with willing soul adopts thee heir, and his high scepter yields to the possession of thy royal hand. 
ascend his throne, descending now from him. And long live Henry, fourth of that name. In God's name, I'll ascend the regal throne. Mary, God forbid! Worst in this royal presence may I speak, yet best beseeming me to speak the truth. What subject can give sentence on his king? And who sits here that is not Richard's subject? And shall the figure of God's majesty, his captain, steward, deputy-elect, anointed, crowned, planted many years, be judged by subject and inferior breath, and he himself not present? Oh, for offended God, that in a Christian climate souls refined should show so heinous, black, obscene a deed. My lord of Hereford here, whom you call king, is a foul traitor to proud Hereford's king. And if you crown him, let me prophesy. The blood of English shall manure the ground, and future ages groan for this foul act. And in this seat of peace, tumultuous war shall kin with kin and kind with kind confound. Disorder, horror, fear, and mutiny shall here inhabit. And this land be called the field of Golgotha and dead men's skulls. Oh, if you raise this house against this house, it will the woefulest division prove that ever fell upon this cursed earth. Prevent it. Resist it. Let it not be so, lest child, child's children, cry against your woe. Well, have you argued, sir? And for your pains of capital treason, we arrest you here. My Lord of Westminster, be it your charge to keep him safely till his day of trial. May it please you, lords, to grant the common suit. Fetch here the Richard, and in common view he may surrender, so we shall proceed without suspicion. I will be his conduct. Lords, you that are here under our rest, procure your sureties for your days of answer. Little are we beholding to your love, and little looked for at your helping hands. Alack, why am I sent forward to a king before I have shook off the regal thoughts wherewith I reigned? I hardly yet have learned to insinuate, flatter, bow, and bend my limbs. Give sorrow leave a while to tutor me to this submission. <laughs> yet, I well remember the favors of these men. Were they not mine? <laughs> Did they not cry sometime, all hail to me? <laughs> so Judas did to Christ, but he in twelve found truth in all but one, I in twelve thousand. No. God save the king! Will no man say amen? Am I both priest and clerk? Well then, amen. God save the king! Although I be not he. And yet, amen, if heaven do think him me. To do what service am I sent for hither? To do that office of thine own good will, which tired majesty did make thee offer, the resignation of thy state and crown to Henry Bolingbroke. Give me the crown. Here, cousin, seize the crown. this side my hand, and on that side yours. Now is this golden crown like a deep well that owes two buckets, filling one another, the emptier ever dancing in the air, the other down, unseen and full of water. The bucket down and full of tears am I. Drinking my griefs whilst you mount up on high. I thought you had been willing to resign. My crown I am. But still my griefs are mine. You may my glories and my state depose, but not my griefs. 
Still am I king of those. Part of your cares you give me with your crown. Your cares set up do not pluck my cares down. My care is loss of care by old care done. Your care is gain of care by new care won. The cares I give I have though given away. They tend the crown, yet still with me they stay. Are you contented to resign the crown? I. No. No, I. For I must nothing be. Therefore, no. No, I. I resign to thee. Now mark me how I will undo myself. I give this heavy weight from off my head and this unwieldy scepter from my hand, the pride of kingly sway from out my heart. With mine own tears, I wash away my bomb. With my own hands, I give away my crown. With mine own tongue, deny my sacred state. With mine own breath, release all duties, rights. All pomp and majesty I do forswear. My manners, rents, revenues I forego. My acts, decrees, and statutes I deny. God pardon all oaths that are broke to me. God keep all vows unbroke that swear to thee. Make me that nothing have with nothing grieved. And thou with all please thou hast all achieved. Long mayest thou live in Richard's seat to sit, and soon lie Richard in a, a, an earthly pit. God save King Henry, unkinged Richard says, and send him many years of sunshine days. What more remains? No more. But that you read these accusations and these grievous crimes committed by your person and your followers against the state and prophet of this land. And that by confessing them, the souls of men may deem that you are worthily deposed. Must I do so? And must I ravel out my wreath of folly? Gentle Northumberland, if thy offenses were upon record, would it not shame thee in so fair a troop to read a lecture of them? If thou wouldst, there shouldst thou find one heinous article containing the deposing of a king and cracking the strong warrant of an oath marked with a blot damned in the book of heaven. Nay, all of you that stand and look upon whilst that my wretchedness doth bait itself, though some of you with pilot wash your hands showing an outward pity. Yet you pilots have here delivered me to my sour cross, and water cannot wash away your sin. My lord, dispatch, read all these articles. My eyes are full of tears, I cannot see. And yet salt water blinds them not so much, but they can see a sort of traitors here. Hey. If I turn mine eyes upon myself, I find myself a traitor with the rest. For I have given here my soul's consent to undeck the pompous body of a king, made glory base and sovereignty a slave, proud majesty a subject, state a peasant. My lord. No lord of thine, thou halt, insulting man. No, no man's lord. I have no name, no title, no, not that name was given me at the font, but tis usurped. Alack, the heavy day that I've worn, so many winters out and know not now what name to call myself. Oh, 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 oh that I, I were a mockery king of snow standing before the sun of Bolingbroke to melt myself away in water drops. Good king, great king, 
and yet not greatly good. And if my word be sterling yet in England, let it command a mirror, hither straight, that it may show me what face I have since it is bankrupt of his majesty. Go, fetch a looking glass. Read all this paper while the glass doth come. Fiend, thou torments me ere I come to hell. Urge it no more, my lord Northumberland. The commons will not then be satisfied. They shall be satisfied. I'll read enough when I do see the very book indeed where all my sins are writ, and that's myself. Give me the glass, and therein will I read. No deeper wrinkles yet. A sorrow struck so many blows upon this face of mine and made no deeper wounds. <sighs> Flattering glass. Like to my followers in prosperity, thou dost beguile me. Was this the face that every day under his household roof did keep ten thousand men? Was this the face that, like the sun, did make beholders wink? Was this the face that faced so many follies and was at last outfaced by Bolingbroke? A brittle glory shineth in this face. As brittle as the glory is the face. For there it is. Cracked in a hundred shivers. Mark, silent king, the moral of this sport, how soon my sorrow hath destroyed my face. The shadow of your sorrow hath destroyed the shadow of your face. Say that again. The shadow of my sorrow. Oh, let's see. Tis very true. My grief lies all within. And these external manners of laments are merely shadows to the unseen grief that swells with silence in the tortured soul. There lies the substance, and I thank thee, King, for thy great bounty that not only givest me cause to wail, but teachest me the way how to lament the cause. I'll beg one boon, and then be gone and trouble you no more. Shall I obtain it? Name it, fair cousin. Fair cousin? <laughs> I am greater than a king, for when I was king, my flatterers were then but subjects. Being now a subject, I have a king here to my flatterer. Being so great, I have no need to beg. Yet ask. And shall I have? You shall. Then give me leave to go. Whither? Whither you will, so I were from your sight. Go. Some of you convey him to the tower. Oh, oh, oh good. Convey! Conveyors are you all that rise thus nimbly by a true king's fall! On Wednesday next, we solemnly set down our coronation. Lords, prepare yourselves. The woes to come! The children yet unborn shall feel this day as sharp to them as thorn. You holy clergymen, is there no plot to rid the realm of this pernicious blot? My lord, before I freely speak my mind herein, you shall not only take the sacrament to bury mine intents, but also to effect whatever I shall happen to devise. I see your brows are full of discontent, your hearts of sorrow and your eyes of tears. Come home with me to supper, and I'll lay a plot shall show us all a merry day. This way the king will come. This is the way to Julius Caesar's ill-erected tower, to whose flint bosom my condemned lord is doomed a prisoner by Bolingbroke. Here let us rest, 
if this rebellious earth have any resting for her true king's queen. But soft. But see. Oh, rather, do not see. My fair rose wither. Yet look up. Behold, that you in pity may dissolve to do and wash him fresh again with true love tears. Thou the model of where old Troy did stand, thou map of honour, thou King Richard's tomb and not King Richard, thou most beauteous in, why should our favoured grief be lodged in thee, when triumph is become an alehouse guest? Join not with grief, fair woman, do not so, to make my end too sudden. Learn, good soul. To think our former state a happy dream, from which awaked the truth of what we are shows us but this. I am sworn, brother sweet, to grim necessity, and he and I will keep a league till death. Hie thee to France, and cloister thee in some religious house. Our holy lives must win a new world's crown, which our profane hours here have stricken down. What? Is my Richard Bolton's shape and mind transformed and weakened? Has Bolingbroke deposed thine intellect? Has he been in thy heart? The lion dying for his paw and wounds the earth, if nothing else, with rage to be overpowered. And wilt thou? Pupil, like, take thy correction mildly, kiss the rod, and fawn on rage with base humility, which art a lion and a king of beasts. Oh, a king of beasts, indeed. If aught but beasts, I had been still a happy king of men. Good sometime, queen, prepare thee hence for France. I think I am dead. That even here thou takest as from my deathbed thy last living leave. In winter's tedious night sit by the fire with good old folks and let them tell thee tales of woeful ages long ago beated. And ere thou bid good night to quit their griefs, tell thou the lamentable tale of me and send the hearers weeping to their beds. For why the senseless brands will sympathize, sympathize the heavy accents of thy moving tongue and in compassion weep the fire out. And some will mourn in ashes, some coal black, for the deposing of a rightful king. My lord, the mind of Bolingbroke is changed. You must the pomfret not onto the tower, and madame, there is order taken for you with all swift speed. You must away to France. Northumberland, thou ladder wherewithal the mounting of Bolingbroke ascends my throne. <laughs> the time shall not be many hours of age, more than it is ere foul sin gathering head shall break into corruption. Thou shalt think, though he divide the realm and give thee half, it is too little helping him to all, and he shall think that thou, which knows the way to plant unrightful kings, wilt know again, being ne'er so little urged, another way to pluck him headlong from the usurped throne. My guilt be on my head, and there an end. Take leave and part, for you must part forthwith. Banish us both, and send the king with me. Yeah, that was some love, but little policy. Then whither he goes, thither let me go. So two together weeping make one woe. Weep thou for me in France. I for thee here. Better far off than near, bear near than near. Go count thy ways with sighs. I mine with groans. Your longest way shall have the longest moans. <laughs> Twice for one step I'll groan, the way being short, and piece the way out with a heavy heart. Come, come, in wooing sorrow let's be brief, since wedding it 
There is such length in grief. We make woe wanton with this fond delay. Once more. Adieu. The rest let sorrow say. My lord, you told me you would tell the rest when weeping made you break the story off of our two cousins coming into London. Where did I leave? At that sad stop, my lord, where rude, misgoverned hands from windows tops threw dust and rubbish on King Richard's head. Then, as I said, the Duke, great Bolingbroke, mounted upon a hot and fiery steed, whilst all tongues cried, God save thee, Bolingbroke! Mm. Jesu preserve thee! Welcome, Bolingbroke! Whilst he, from the one side to the other, turning, bareheaded, lower than his proud steed's neck, bespake them thus, I thank you, countrymen. And thus still doing, thus he passed along. Oh, like poor Richard, where rode he the whilst? As in a theater, the eyes of men after a well-graced actor leaves the stage are idly bent on him that enters next, thinking his prattle to be tedious. Even so, or with much more contempt, men's eyes did scowl on gentle Richard. No man cried, God save him. No joyful tongue gave him his welcome home. But dust was thrown upon his sacred head, which with such gentle sorrow he shook off. But heaven hath a hand in these events, to whose high will we bound our calm contents. To Bolingbroke are we sworn subjects now, whose state and honor I for I allow. Well, here comes my son, O'Murrow. O'Murrow that was, but that is lost for being Richard's friend, and madam, you must call him Rutland now. I am in Parliament pledge for his truth and lasting fealty to the new-made king. Welcome, my son. What news from Oxford? Hold those just in triumphs? For aught I know, my lord, they do. What seal is that that hangs without thy bosom? Yea, looks thou pale, let me see the writing. No, I do beseech you, pardon me, I may not show it. I will be satisfied, let me see it, I say. Treason, foul treason, villain, traitor, slave. What is the matter, my lord? God, for his mercy, what treachery is here? What, what, what is it, my lord? Saddle my horse, now! By my honor, by my life, by my troth, I will appease the villain. What is the matter, O Merle? Could mother be content? It is no more than my poor life must answer. I will unto the king. Strike him, O Merle. Poor boy, thou art amazed. Hence, villain, never more come in my sight. Why, York, what wilt thou do? Wilt thou not hide the trespass of thine own? Have we more sons, or are we like to have? Is he not like thee? Is he not thine own? Thou fond, mad woman, wilt thou conceal this dark conspiracy? A dozen of them here have tamed the sacrament and interchangeably set down their hands to kill the king at Oxford. He shall be none. We'll keep him here, then what is that to him? Away, fond woman. Were he twenty times my son, I would appeach him. Hadst thou? groaned for him as I have. Thou wouldst be more pitiful, but now I know thy mind. Thou dost suspect that I have been disloyal to thy bed, and that he is a bastard, not thy son, sweet York. Sweet husband, be not of that mind. He is as like thee as a man may be, not like to me or any of my kin, and yet I love him. Make way! After, O Merle. Mount thee upon his horse, spur post, and get before him to the king, and beg thy pardon ere he do accuse thee. I'll not be long behind, though I be old, I doubt not but to ride as fast as York, and never will I rise up from the ground till Bolingbroke hath pardoned thee. Away! Be gone! God 
God save your grace. I do beseech your majesty to have some conference with your grace alone. What is the matter with our cousin now? Forever may my knees grow to the earth and my tongue cleave to the roof within my mouth unless a pardon ere I rise or speak. Intended or committed was this fault. If on the first, how heinous ere it be, to win thy after love I pardon thee. My liege, beware, look to thyself, thou hast a traitor in thy presence there. What is the matter, uncle? Peruse this writing here, and thou shalt know the treason that my haste forbids me show. Now remember, as thou readest thy promise past, I do repent me. Oh, heinous, strong and bold conspiracy. O loyal father of a treacherous son. Thy overflow of good converts to bad, and thy abundant goodness shall excuse this deadly blot in thy digressing son. So shall my virtue be his vices bald, and he shall spend mine honor with his shame, as thriftless sons their scraping father's gold. Mine honor lives when his dishonor dies, or my shamed life in his dishonor lies. Thou killst me in his life, giving him breath, the traitor lives, the true man's put to death. What ho, my liege, for God's sake, let me in. Oh, speak with me, pity me, open the door. A beggar begs that never begged before. Thou frantic woman, what dost thou make here? Shall thy old dugs once more a traitor rear? Sweet York, be patient. Hear me, gentle liege. Rise up, good aunt. No, not yet, I thee beseech. For ever will I walk upon my knees and never see that day that happy sees till thou give joy, until thou bid me joy by pardoning Rutland, my transgressing boy. Unto my mother's prayers I bend my knee. Against them both my true joints bend it be. Ill mayest thou thrive if thou grant any grace. Pleads he in earnest. Look upon his face. His eyes do drop no tears. His prayers are in jest. His words come from his mouth, ours from our breast. Our knees shall kneel till to the ground they grow. His prayers are full of false hypocrisy, ours of true zeal and deep integrity. Our prayers do outpray his. Then let them have that mercy which true prayer ought to have. Good aunt, stand up. I do not sue to stand. Pardon is all the suit I have in hand. I pardon him. God shall pardon me. Oh, happy vantage of a kneeling knee, a god on earth thou art. But for our trusty brother-in-law and the abbot, destruction straight shall dog them at the heels. Good uncle help to order several powers to Oxford or where these traitors are. They shall not live within this world, I swear, but I will have them if I once know where. Uncle, farewell. And cousin, too, adieu. Your mother well hath prayed, and prove you true. Come, my old son, I pray God make thee new. Didst thou not mark the king what words he speak? Have I no friend will rid me of this living fear? Was it not so? These were his very words. Have I no friend, quoth he. He spake it twice and urged it twice together, did he not? He did. And speaking it, he wistly looked on me, and who should say, I would thou wert the man that would divorce his terror from my heart, meaning the king of Pomfret. Come, let's go. I am the king's friend and will rid his foe. studying how I may compare this prison where I live unto the world. And for because the world is populous and here is not a creature but myself, I cannot do it. Yet I'll hammer it out. My brain, I'll prove the female to my soul, my soul the father, 
and these two beget a generation of still breeding thoughts. And these same thoughts, people, this little world, and humors like the people of this world, for no thought is contented. The better sort, as thoughts of things divine, are intermixed with scruples and do set the word itself against the word. As thus, come little ones. And then again, it is as hard to come as for a camel to thread the postern of a small needle's eye. Thoughts tending to ambition, they do plot unlikely wonders. How these vain, weak nails may tear a passage through the flinty ribs of this hard world, my ragged prison walls. And for they cannot die in their own pride. Thoughts tending to content flatter themselves that they are not the first of fortune slaves, nor shall not be the last. Like silly beggars who, sitting in the stocks, ref refuge their shame, that many have, and others must sit there. And in this thought they find a kind of ease, bearing their own misfortunes on the back of such as have before endured the like. Thus play I in one person many people, and none contented. Sometimes am I king, then treasons make me wish myself a beggar, and so I am. Then crushing penury persuades me I was better when a king. Then I am kinged again, and by and by think that I am unkinged by Bolingbrook, and straight am nothing. But whate'er I be, nor I nor any man that but man is with nothing shall be pleased till he be eased with be. Nothing. Music do I hear. <laughs> Keep time. How sour sweet music is when time is broken, no proportion kept. <laughs> so it is in the music of men's lives. And here have I the daintiness of ear to check time broke in a disordered string. But for the conquered of my state and time had not an ear to hear my true time broke. I wasted time. And now doth time waste me. This music mads me. Let it sound no more. For though it have hope madmen to their wits, and me it seems it will make wise men mad. Get blessing on his heart that gives it me. For tis a sign of love. And love to Richard. It's a strange brooch in this all hating world. Welcome, my lord. What is the news? I have to London sent the heads of Oxford, Salbury, Blunt, and Kent. The manner of their taking may appear large discourse in this paper here. We thank thee, gentle Percy, for thy pains, and to thy worth will add right worthy gains. My lord. I have from Oxford sent to London the heads of Brocus and Sir Bennet Seeley, two of the dangerous consorted traitors that sought at Oxford thy dire overthrow. Thy pains shall not be forgot. Right noble is thy merit, well I wot. The grand conspirator, abbot of Westminster, with clog of conscience and sour melancholy, hath yielded up his body to the grave. But here is Carlyle living. Abide thy kingly doom and sentence of his pride. Carlyle, this is your doom. Choose out some secret place, some reverend room, more than thou hast, and with it 
enjoy thy life. So as thou livest in peace, die free from strife. For though mine enemy thou hast ever been, high sparks of honor in thee have I seen. Great king, within this coffin I present thy buried fear, wherein all breathless lies the mightiest of thy greatest enemies, Richard of Bordeaux. Exton, I thank thee not, for thou hast wrought a deed of slander with thy fatal hand upon my head and all this famous land. From your own mouth, my lord, did I this deed. They love not poison that do poison need, nor do I thee. Though I did wish him dead, I hate the murderer. Love him, murdered. The guilt of conscience take thou for thy labor, but neither my good word nor princely favor. With Cain, go wander through shades of night, and never show thy head by day nor light. Lords, I protest my soul is full of woe. That blood should sprinkle me to make me grow. Come, mourn with me for that I do lament and put on sullen black incontinent. I'll make a voyage to the Holy Land, wash this blood from off my guilty hand. March sadly after, grace my mornings here, weeping after this untimely beer.